Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I can't hear anyone. Um, we apologize for a little delay. We have some technical um, problems. We ask the devs of the ethers to help us to establish a connectivity between all of us. Uh, Claire, uh, uh, in New Zealand, would lead us in meditation. Claire, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Hello, is anybody there? Um, I seem to have lost uh, connection. Uh, yes, Claire, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Ah, there you are. Goodness. Sorry, I, I absolutely couldn't hear a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, now we're starting late. Um, are you starting the um, sharing the screen, Sasha? Uh, yes, we already seen Jose's screen. So, um, and seems like the connection now restored. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you fine. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Beautiful. So, so can we begin? <laughs> Yes, um, we are already broadcasting, so please uh, take the microphone and welcome this circle. Ah, oh, well, thank you. Greetings, everyone. Apologies for my um, technology, technological hiccup. It's good to be with you all. Um, as Sasha would say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And on behalf of the 2025 initiative, we welcome you to today's webinar. The Loving Science of Healing, of Healing Cleavages with Dr. Jose Becerra. Jose will be speaking to us from Atlanta, Georgia about the seventh seed group, that of the scientific servers. He will be joined by co-discussants Helena Bacuz, who's in the US, and me, Claire, in New Zealand. And Alex Ratcliffe, who's in the UK, will join us for the question and answer session. We are meeting in the energies of an especially potent Aquarius full moon and not too far from now, a total lunar eclipse. There will be an opportunity for many of us, I think, in the northern hemisphere and certain parts of Africa to witness the eclipse. And in addition to this event, on the 22nd of January, Venus and Jupiter will form a tight conjunction. They'll be just 2.5 degrees um, apart from each other. And Jose will no doubt provide more details about the astrological implications around this. So we'll begin our work as we do with an alignment. Take a moment to settle on our chairs. Back straight. Shoulders soft, and our feet flat on the floor. If it's comfortable to do so, I invite you to close your eyes as we turn our attention to the breath. Noticing our in-breath. And our out-breath. Establishing a quiet, regular rhythm. We breathe a silent OM into the physical body, releasing all tension. We breathe a silent OM into the mental body allowing the mind to become still. We breathe a silent OM into the emotional body, neutralizing any disruptive, conflicted energies and letting go of the day's distractions.
Feeling into the stillness, we withdraw our consciousness from the personality and relax deeply and expectantly into each other's presence and into the presence of the group soul. Breathing together in a sense of shared purpose and intention. United in Christ's love, we know ourselves as individual souls within the greater group soul. Meeting as a whole of many parts in a field of lighted love and spiritual will. We affirm the presence and radiatory love of the Christ with us. And we breathe in the love that connects us all in this group that underlies our purpose and that is at the heart of the work we do together. Extending our alignment to connect with a new group of world servers, we visualize our individual lights coming together to create a vast and brilliant network of light surrounding the planet. May all that is not light be washed clean by light. We extend our alignment to the outer edges of the great ashram, the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, connecting the radiance of our heart center with the heart center of hierarchy, the Christ, and upwards to Shambhala where the will of God is known. Through the heart of hierarchy, we connect with the hearts of people of goodwill all around the world. Together, we invoke the presence and assistance of the hierarchy and the Christ and of all those beings in the subtle realms whose purpose is the increase of light and love in the world and the fostering of clarity and coherence within the group soul and within humanity. And we affirm the intentions of the 2025 initiative to create a safe and vitalized space for the exchange of questions, inspiration and ideas in support of humanity and the working out of the plan. May we listen and learn with the ear of the heart. And may the will to love be our guiding light. So it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Jose Becerra. Since his professional retirement, he's become a full-time student of the four classical disciplines, quadrivium, namely number, geometry, music, and cosmology and their applications when it comes to addressing the problems of humanity. Since 1999, Jose has devoted his esoteric work to the study and practice of Agni Yoga. He recently translated the book Introduction to Agni Yoga by Vicente Beltran Anglada. Jose has worked along uh, with the new group of world servers in the fields of government, medicine, international health and mathematical epidemiology. Jose, welcome, and we very much look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this morning or today. 
and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction, uh, Claire, and for setting the, the space. Thank you for this opportunity to share in service with all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being there. Science, the quest for truth at all levels, is the discipline to which I've devoted my entire life. The dual life of discipleship also applies to the scientific method. I've explored both the exoteric and the esoteric scientific methods. I found them to be expressions of the same discipline of observation, recognition, and revelation, the tasks of all bona fide trained observers and observers in training. But today I want to address science itself and sold by Venus and the fifth ray in its broadest meaning as a bridging tool to heal cleavages between spirit and matter, good and evil, past, present and future, between religion and science itself. In fact, as shown in this chart, the current period around the full moon in Aquarius blends the energies of Capricorn devoted to the New World religion in our previous seminar with the energies of Aquarius, one of the three constellations through which the fifth ray reaches our solar system and the Earth. Please note how Uranus, seventh ray, and Jupiter, second ray, I related during this period in an almost perfect square with a full moon alignment and between uh, Jupiter and Neptune. And as uh, Claire mentioned, there will be uh, an alignment of Venus with uh, Jupiter uh, in a few days. This Venus I mean, Jupiter and Uranus, Ray 2 and Ray 7, are the esoteric and exoteric rulers of the tropical sun of Aquarius, as many of us know. So, Aquarius is the 11th sign, the 11th hour of the zodiac. So, let's take a minute to contemplate the poetry of the glyphs naming the three signs of the fifth ray. Leo looks like a string or cord, a word derived from core, the heart. Sagittarius evokes the image of a bow and arrow, the arrow of time engaged in a taut string aimed at its goal. Aquarius is a wave, a sine wave, symbolic of periodic motion like the simple harmonic motion of the heartbeat. The number five itself resembles an S, the letter S, another sine wave, and so on. The study of symbols is paramount, is the paramount way to develop and train the intuitive sense. Signs is derived from the word scientia, that is, what we perceive through the senses, the five physical senses, the common sense of the mind, and the seventh intuitive sense. It is interesting to study the geometric configuration of the triangles of the zodiac signs through which the seven rays are expressed in our solar system. We can see here how the fifth ray serves as a bridge or link between the 137 and the 246 alignments of the rays. Halina and Sheldon, who presented on the previous uh, webinar, will be addressing that link between the fifth ray and the 137 uh, that we discussed last time in, uh, in Capricorn. And uh, Claire's poetry will be addressing the bridge with the uh, 246, uh, particularly the poetry revealing simplicity. The plane of mind, the fifth from the above, 
wherein the casa body lodging the solar angel is located, serves a similar bridging function in building the Antakarana. The seed group of scientific servers, one of the 10 or 12 seed groups, is the strategic planning group or think tank devoted to employing fifth ray methods to usher the new civilization and culture in the dawning age of Aquarius. We are told that the work of the seventh group, and I'm reading from this slide, which is the field of sciences, of science is closely aligned to that of the seventh ray, uh, Uranus, uh, as we mentioned here, uh, is strictly magical in its technique. This is coming from uh, externalization of the hierarchy, which is the quote that I have up here. Uh, magical, synthesizing life, solar energies, and lunar forces, and it's a work to be carried forward by first-ray workers, assisted by seven-ray aspirants, using fifth-ray methods, evidence-based methods. Therefore, they will combine the, the personnel uh, of this group will be uh, those working, uh, destroying outgrown forms, and in that uh, direction, uh, I think uh, that the book Glamour with the three techniques, the one of the presence to dispel illusion, the technique of the light to dispel glamour, and the technique of indifference, all those uh, are working in that direction, destroying outgrown forms. Uh, they will combine in the personnel, the findings of the scientists uh, uh, who have penetrated uh, behind uh, the outer forum, uh, such as in the study of symbols and poetry. And the practical work of the magician who working under the law uh, creates uh, new forms. This group of disciples, we are told, uh, will make a close study of the problem of evil, bringing a better understanding of the purpose existing behind matter or substance, different from the influence, enlightened and different purpose of the soul aspect. And this is what uh, the Master Decay means by the word, by the phrase scientific service. The work of this group uh, is uh, threefold. Uh, they will formulate new hypotheses, taking uh, the most adv advanced inferences of the workers in the field of science. And this is uh, how, how you see the usefulness of the technique of the presence, which is essentially revelatory. Uh, they will also uh, outline the nature of the incoming forces, uh, which will determine and motivate the future soul culture of the time. And third, uh, blend scientific knowledge with intuitive idealism. Uh, through a right interplay of forces, uh, such as the Deva uh, Kingdom, uh, clearing the way for those intellectual impediments, uh, which will which have, have blocked man's approach to the superhuman world. And again, the usefulness of the, the technique uh, of, light, uh, of the presence, uh, dispelling illusion in that, uh, in that sense. Though that was the good news. Now to the warnings. Uh, uh, this group, uh, the master tells us, uh, uh, is something that uh, in the 1940s, uh, when the, the books were written, uh, its expression was limited and is still being limited by the lack of recognition of the soul as an established fact of science. This uh, prophecy that by 1995, uh, this discovery, the fact of the soul, will be part of the acknowledged facts of science by the year 1975, uh, we can, we can uh, tell for sure that hasn't happened yet, has not been fulfilled. And uh, I invite us all to discuss why in a Q and a session later. There has been uh, either a delay in the plan uh, or there might be a different way to interpret uh, this prophecy. Uh, let us consider then other imminent scientific discoveries, discoveries prophecy by the Master DK uh, through Alice Bailey. And let's go uh, on those. Uh, he first uh, uh, prophesied uh, in the 1920s uh, the release of the energy of the atom 
uh, which actually happened uh, in 1945. Uh, so that was a fulfilled uh, prophecy. Uh, the second discovery uh, that this group will be uh, asked uh, uh, to meditate on uh, is uh, investigations on the nature of light and color, specifically the development of the etheric vision and that's an area that I have paid particular attention lately, given the situation, the political situation in the world, and the fact that democracies, that democracies in the world have been failing as prophesied by decay. Uh, this was one, uh, one prophecy that, in fact, uh, is being fulfilled. The democracies are failing uh, the, the people and the government, and therefore has seen the need to invoke uh, a concept of, uh, of the concept of the hierarchical democracy. Uh, and the reason I bring this here is because uh, on this second discovery, uh, Master DK tells us that one day when a core, a, a critical mass of people uh, develop etheric vision, they will be able to see the light in each individual and therefore elect representatives according to that light. I think there will be a major shift in the way we understand democracy to date. And the third discovery is the study of sound, the effect of sound. Uh, and uh, the, uh, he, in another section of the books, uh, he, I think, is in comes Cosmic Fire. Uh, uh, Alice Bailey uh, refers to uh, the future scientist uh, transforming mathematical and scientific formulas into sound, music, and make them effective, more effective this way. So these are three developments that I think this seed group uh, should uh, uh, pay attention to as they will usher the, the new age and uh, produce uh, uh, the needed changes in this transition period to inaugurate a new area, new era uh, of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, uh, the keynote of the new, of the new age. What evidence do we have on the progress of the work related to this group of scientific servers? As shown on this slide, I have chosen uh, two uh, major ones. There are others, but uh, I think the Institute of Nordic Sciences uh, is, for me, uh, the premier uh, organization working on, on uh, consciousness research uh, at this point. Uh, I invite you to go to their website and see the different projects that they are sponsoring and conducting uh, themselves. Uh, they have a very interesting uh, project that they inherited uh, from a different uh, laboratory, uh, the Global Consciousness Project, which is uh, studying the way that human intention can affect random number generators. A group of people uh, meditate and they're able to change the randomness uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a computer processor uh, producing the random numbers. And that has been proven to uh, very, very highly significant. Uh, uh, that will uh, point that will negate uh, that is just a chance uh, effect. Uh, some of this is included in the Dean uh, uh, Radin's uh, book, Real Magic. I have the, the book uh, cover there for you to uh, consider uh, he recently published uh, it was a re-edition of this of this book uh, and uh, the combination of uh, science and magic and the title itself real magic uh, just uh, called uh, my attention uh, I have read it uh, have reviewed it and uh, I recommend it the other group I would like to uh, uh, ask to uh, focus our attention to is a group that I've been following for several decades I uh, started with uh, Ian Stevenson's work in the U of Virginia, uh, Department of Psychiatry, uh, Ian Stevenson is, uh, was a psychiatrist, he passed on, uh, who studied uh, case studies uh, of uh, reincarnation uh, among children in particular, birth marks that he could uh, document being the result of a wound uh, in the previous incarnation, for instance. Well, this group has, uh, is still working. Uh, and they are studying the survival of consciousness. Recently, in the, in the May 2018 issue of the magazine Lion's Roar, that's the, the, the copy that I have in there, the facsimile, uh, they carry an excellent review article on the scientific case for reincarnation, uh, and I highly recommend uh, its reading. And third, and this is my own uh, idea, pet project, uh, Let's discuss it in the Q&A. What do you think about it? Uh, but given the, the prophecy and the fact that we need to prove 
uh, the effect of the soul, and at least uh, survival after death will prove the, 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 the persistence of, con of consciousness. Uh, I am thinking about what about a voluntary commitment uh, by disciples uh, to briefly contact surviving spiritual co-workers to prove by providing uncontroversial factual evidence the survival of, consci of consciousness after death. Is that possible? Uh, I don't know. Uh, probably we'll find out uh, in my case uh, in, in, uh, in three or four decades, uh, maybe sooner. Uh, but uh, that's an idea that uh, I have wondered. I have seen some uh, exp experiments being conducted worldwide with the use of the radio and the TV with the special sensors. Uh, but uh, just uh, an idea that I'm throwing uh, out there. So, let us summarize the work of this uh, seventh group of scientific servers that will reveal the essential spirituality of all scientific work. Uh, uh, it will relate science and religion, and this is the area that uh, Helena will be touching on uh, uh, shortly. Uh, uh, work with the building forces of the universe. Of course, we know that those are the Deva Kingdom. Uh, the development of uh, etheric vision, we have uh, already addressed that. And uh, their work with uh, trying to research uh, and prove uh, the persistence of the soul, uh, or at least the survival of consciousness through the study of reincarnation and the law of rebirth. It is my belief and my experience that all seed groups, all seed groups are sponsored by some ashram of the hierarchy of masters. There are five ashrams currently active in the preparatory work of externalization as part of the endeavor of the new group of world servers. For the scientific group, uh, Master Hilarion uh, serves this function. We are told the Master Hilarion uh, is actively occupied in the field of America, uh, stimulating uh, intuitive perception uh, with the psychical research movements, and uh, again with the problem of reincarnation, uh, the world of departed souls. Uh, all uh, scientific servers, I think, are naturally drawn to or influenced by Master Hilarion's ashram. Given the poetic expression of some of his inspired work, such as Mabel Collins' Light on the Path and the Book of Revelations, it is easier to feel and understand the Venus side of the fifth ray, I think. Furthermore, the major advances in psychical research, such as that conducted and sponsored by ions, uh, can be attributed to this source of inspiration. Which brings me to the subject of uh, cleavages and healing. There is one specific cleavage that I would like to address. This is how our brain consciousness dissects the arrow of time into past, present, and future. How do we recognize time? And how that uh, is uh, an example of the principle of cleavage. Pastor uh, Joakul suggested to a disciple the following siddhat for meditation. The past has gone. I am that past. It makes me what I am. The future comes. I also am the coming destiny, and therefore I am that. The present flows from out the past, the future colors that which is. I make the future also by my present knowledge of the past and the beauty of the present. And therefore, I am that I am. I would like, you to, uh, I would like to invite you to consider uh, this uh, siddha for your own personal reflection and inner healing, particularly as we enter the new year. 
I would like to offer, to also offer my own reflection on this meditation. We are told that the disciple is will, the ruler of time and the organizer in time of space. He is will, the ruler of time and the organizer in time of space. With that thought in mind, I would like to conclude my talk with this personal reflection on time. For you, a symbol is an engine driven by psychic energy. This energy transforms, transforms past structures of knowledge into ever-expanding layers of renewed meaning in order to reveal future possibilities. The eternal now, envisioning the future, transfigures the past so that we become what we really are, have always been and will always ever be a timeless expression of being as we contemplate our simple monadic essence within and without. Profound attentiveness to the present circumstances or mindfulness, serene expectancy of future possibilities, and the perfect adaptability of former structures of service whose usefulness is past. Profound attentiveness, serene expectancy, and perfect adaptability. These are the three keynotes of Agni Yoga, showing the fiery way to Shambhala. Agni is the fire of purification, fusion, and synthesis. Yoga is the binding force of cohesion, forging the eternal now out of past recognitions, present observations, and future revelations. Agni, the monadic spark, the one that, having pervaded all life with a fragment of itself, remains. Long live Agni, the fiery waters of life, poured forth for thirsty humanity. The effect of Aquarius upon the hierarchy, we are told in the book, The Race and the Initiations, is to bring in the energy of Shambhala, which is essentially, essentially the energy of life itself, implemented by the will. So be it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And now I would like uh, to ask Helena to join me uh, in sharing her thoughts. And after her, uh, Claire will do uh, likewise. Well, thank you very much, Jose, for that extraordinarily illuminating presentation. And as you have asked us to take um, a specific set of slides to address um, or deepen the discussion, um, I would ask you to, to go back up to slide 12. You've asked me to look at slides 12, 13, and 14. So I will begin here. <clears throat> and beginning with, with the um, the key idea that this seventh group of scientific servers reveals the essential spirituality of all scientific work. And I find this phrase um, so beautifully conducive to bringing in the thoughts of the new world religion and religion in and of itself. When we think about religion, what what its meaning is in a very simple way it means relegare or relationship with our divine nature it addresses what we are in fact and in truth and who we are as psychological spiritual beings and as a result of these two what are we to do 
in our incarnated forms. So I want to <clears throat> support so much of that Jose said with some readings from Master DK from a number of various sources. And the first that I'd like to address is the fifth ray lord and some of his his the beauty of his names before i do um this this idea of science and religion has really hit the consciousness of the thinkers of the race there have been a number of books written now about science and religion and in a few moments we'll talk about how that has been coming true through the Master Hilarion. And when I think about science without religion, I would find in, in the initial stages of thinking about it as, as something that's dry and mechanical. And science without religion is, is a veil of illusion upon the reality that stands behind it, distorting the truth of things the essence of form, and yet religion without science can so easily devolve into, into beliefs, many of them false beliefs or glamours and illusions if the believer is not scientifically informed. So it is the relationship and the marriage of science with religion, matter with truth, that unfolds a spectrum of infinity that brings forward into our consciousness divine truth and beauty and goodness, releasing the veils of illusion that separate us from our Creator. And yet it is through the form, we are told, that we must come to these realizations that form itself becomes our aid for divine revelation. And it is the way things are wired in this universe is that we discover our divinity through the form. The purpose of religion is to bring our awareness back to source, to our divine origins from which we came. And I would say that we cannot really know happiness, real joy, and eventually the bliss of spirit until that conscious journey has begun and is finally consummated so that we can stand and live in the full awareness of our divinity our essential nature there's a beautiful quote from white eagle the book white eagle on the divine mother who says fundamentally there is only one religion how can we describe it it is a state of affinity with infinity. I'll repeat that. It is a state of affinity with infinity. Religion is a permeating essence in life, and the spirit of a person needs to come in harmony, or in other words, be affinitized to this permeating infinite essence. I think someone needs to um, mute themselves. Um, maybe it's Claire. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right. So from here, I would like to read the name of the fifth ray lord, who is the lord of science. And allow these thoughts to land in our consciousness as we hear them. And this is, these are um, sections from Esoteric Psychology 1, page 75. So Ray 5, Concrete Knowledge of Science, he says he starts out with the thunders crash around the mountaintop and dark clouds conceal the form and the mists arise from the watery sphere to distort the wondrous found within the secret place. The form is there and it is sounding its note. 
And then a beam of light illuminates the form and the hidden now appears. The knowledge of God and how he veils himself finds consummation in the thoughts of man. The energies and forces receive their secret names, reveal their inner purpose, and all is seen as rhythm, a returning on itself. The great scroll can now be read. God's purpose and his plans are fixed, and man can read the form. And then he goes on about the plan taking form. The plan is the form, and it is the revelation of the mind of God that form is. So that which is on its way comes as a cloud which veils the sun, but hid behind this cloud of imminence is love. And on the earth is love, and in the heaven is love, and this the love which maketh all things new, must stand revealed. This is the purpose behind all the acts of this great Lord of knowledge. And I want to share an experience when I was um, participating many years ago now um, in the um, in MSc class, uh, Masters of Science and Esotericism, and we were asked to take on a ray, to study the rays more than um, simply conceptually, but to try to experience them. So for a month at a time, we would bring ourselves into living, thinking, experiencing a ray energy. And to my great surprise, when I came to um, immersing myself in ray five, something profound happened i found myself being led or an energy being led directly into the heart of god and in my mind i heard the words the heart of god love wisdom so here it is where the fifth ray leads into the second ray and so now what i want to do is read the a few of the ray lord names five and then a few of the ray lord names of ray two so the the revealer of truth the great connector the divine intermediary the crystallizer of forms the threefold thinking the cloud upon the mountain top, the dividing sword, the heavenly one, the dispenser of knowledge, the angel with the flaming sword, the keeper of the secret, the beloved of the logos, the brother from Sirius, which then would indicate from esoteric knowledge, how this relates to Venus and the coming of the solar angels. And here now are a few wayward names of the second ray. The displayer of glory, the Lord of eternal love, the cosmic magnet, the radiance in the form, the great geometrician, the light bringer, the son of God incarnate, the cosmic Christ. So we can see how these two come together profoundly. And I'm looking for this quote amongst my papers here. Um, maybe I'll just skip it, but it describes in a sentence how the entire purpose of the universe is to enter into and reveal the soul. 
So one more thing about the fifth Ray Lord and what he brings and why he's so incredibly important correlating um, science and religion is that he is one of the unique potencies in relation to the human kingdom. And the reason for this is because the fifth plane of mind is the sphere of his major activity. And it is on this plane that we find the triple aspects of mind, the abstract or higher mind, which is the embodiment of a higher triad, the true soul that we are, the concrete or lower mind of the lower self, and the ego or solar angel, the pure son of mind who expresses intelligence abstractly and concretely. So just as the personality has no other function in the divine plan than to be a channel for and the medium of expression of the soul, so the lower mind is intended to be the channel for the pure inflow of higher mind energy. Okay. So this is um, the beauty of... The, of esoteric knowledge as it relates to the science of the soul and anyone who has studied the constitution of man the chart of the the fullness the full spectrum of a human being on the lowest levels is where this the the matter science is with the higher correspondences in the subtle essence of of a, of a human being this brings me to um, where DK wrote that there are three areas of doubt that now exist in man's mind. And when these three major areas are um, clarified and released, then this will facilitate the bringing in of the new age with its new civilizations. And we're talking about Aquarius bringing in the new science and the new religion so these are the three areas and i cannot take the time now to talk about these but i do want to say so he calls them um the problems the first one is the problem of ideas as the new civilization the problem of god and the problem of immortality and so the problem of god um just listen to, to the beauty of this statement in the world of religion we shall see the solution ridding the human consciousness of another area of doubt the fact of god will be established and men's questioning in this respect will end such a god will not be national or racial not christian hindu or buddhist such a god will not be a figment of man's creative imagination or an extension of his own consciousness but a deity of essential life who is the sum total of all energies the energy of life itself, the energy of love, the energy of intelligence, of active experience, and that energy which produces the interplay between the seen and the unseen. A God most surely transcendent, but at the same time most assuredly imminent. A God of such immensity that the heavens proclaim him, and so intimate that the humblest child can recognize him. And then <clears throat> to address the last point on this slide, the problem of immortality, the third area of doubt, this will be addressed, um, well, it was already addressed um, by Jose, revealing the etheric body. And it is um, said in the teaching that when the Christ reappears in physical form, not just as an overlighting consciousness, but in physical form, one of the four teachings that he will bring humanity will be the fact of immortality um, through the teachings of reincarnation. And that this is how, through the science of reincarnation we will and we do perfect the instrument the form so that the highest energies of who and what we are can flow through into the form okay so quickly now can we go to slide number 13 the next one 
I think uh, we are we are running a bit out of time, uh, Helena. Can okay. we uh, leave that for the Q and A later and uh, uh, let uh, uh, Claire uh, do her her part now? Okay, of course. All right. Thank you. Very very enlightening uh, uh, discussion on those uh, three factors. Uh, okay. Please take your time, um, Claire. Beautiful, Helena and Jose, thank you both. Um, Sasha, can you please share my screen? Uh, yes, just a second. Thank you. Uh, you will be able to share your screen now. Thank you. So, Jose has invited me to address the subject of time and the importance of simplicity in the life of the disciple. We speak often in terms of taking our time over things and of tuning into the soul's note. Some of you may know that poet Mary Oliver, beloved by many, died two days ago in her Florida home. She was 83 years old. Mary Oliver wrote of poetry as a communal act and of poems as enticements of sound. Over and again, she asked herself, how shall I live? What does it mean that the earth is so beautiful? What shall I do about it? And what is the gift I must bring to the world? Suggesting in her asking that these apparently simple questions are actually relevant to each and every one of us. She called them questions of moral imagination. Poems, she said, are a life cherishing force. Not words after all, but fires for the cold. Ropes let down to the lost. Something as necessary as bread in the pockets of the hungry. So my hope today is to bring the fourth and the seventh rays into conversation with the first, the third and the fifth. And to do this via a pair of excellent dance partners, poetry and science. Education in the old paradigm has tended towards segregating the various disciplines tucking each into a separate cubbyhole and focusing on ever tighter parameters of specialty. Near the twain shall meet. One of our tasks, as I understand it, is to draw the different disciplines out of their separate cubbies and place them alongside each other out in the open, where they can engage in dynamic and life-enhancing conversation. The more we can encourage collaborative dialogue, the more we will come to understand the inner workings of our universe which is also to say the inner workings of ourselves and each other. The two are surely inextricably interwoven, perhaps even synonymous. William Wordsworth wrote, poetry is the breath and finest spirit of all knowledge. It is the impassioned expression which is in the countenance of all science. And Tracy K. Smith, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet wrote of wanting to celebrate science and poetry as two languages that imagination speaks. A good many scientists write poetry, and as many poets are deeply engaged in scientific inquiry. A Word document has been posted to the chat box with a link in it to a website called Brain Pickings, a very inspiring website curated by writer-philosopher Maria Popova, who in recent years has hosted two shimmering events in New York City titled The Universe in Verse, her way of honoring the interrelationship between science and the arts. One of the guests at The Universe in Verse chose to read the work of physicist Alan Lightman. And if you haven't read his books, I, please, I urge you to do so. Um, there's also a recommended reading list in the chat box. Um, I have read his um, Einstein's Dreams at least a dozen times over the years. In it, Einstein engages in conversation with his young friend, Besso, a fisherman. The entire book is given over to imaginative hypotheses of different notions of time. In each chapter, Lightman addresses time from a different standpoint. So chapter one begins, suppose time is a circle bending back on itself. In chapter two, there are those who think their bodies don't exist. They live by mechanical time. In chapter four, Time is visible in all places at all times, and beyond any particular clock, a vast scaffold of time stretching out across the universe lays down the law of time equally for all. 
Further on in the book, we encounter a town in many pieces. One neighborhood lives in the 15th century. Another section of the village is a picture of the 18th. Burnt red tiles lie angled on the straight lined roofs. Each section of the village is fastened to a different time. There is one chapter in which time stands still. Raindrops hang motionless in air. Pendulums of clocks float mid-swing. I can still hear Lawson Bracewell saying, when we live in time, we will be on time. Here now, you and I are coming together from around the globe, each of us from our different geographies and time zones. Yet miraculously, we are also all occupying the same time and space. In this moment, at least on some sense and some level, we are living in the past, the present and the future simultaneously. Today is Sunday, the 20th of January, New Zealand, Australia and the Pacifica. It is still Saturday, the 19th in countries to the west of us. When we come together in these shared virtual spaces, I can occupy the past with you, just as you can occupy the future with me. Between us, we're dissolving time and space and sharing a liminal present moment. Something similar happens when we link up across the globe as a triangles network or for our various synchronized meditations. The light of the stars in the night sky are also indicators of events that took place in the long distant past. Their light has traveled at speed through space and no space, arriving to meet us even as we too are rotating on our planet and hurtling through space. It must be said that not only can we straddle the continents, but the cosmos too. Is this not a multitude of wonders? Poet and astrophysicist Diane Ackerman wrote, Science and art both seem to be throwing buckets of light into the dark corners of existence. It didn't make sense that we should be separating them or that we would be separating nature and human nature. It seemed like we should be taking the universe literally as one verse. And listen to this. It's truly something for each of us to take on board. Wonder is the heaviest element on the periodic, periodic table of the heart. Even a tiny piece of it can stop time. And wonder is a bulky emotion. If we let it fill the heart and mind, there really isn't room for anything else. The cinematic rush, rush of life stops, and it's possible to seize a moment and a phenomenon and play with it. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, an Irish astrophysicist, recently collated an anthology titled Dark Matter, Poems of Space. In the book's preface, she wrote, Space has many meanings for me, but like other astronomers, I really use it to refer to the cosmos we study. I know about giving someone space, i.e. freedom to achieve. Then there's the emptiness, the space at the table, which also has connotations of opportunity. And there's inner space, as hard to understand as outer space and more intimate. As a Quaker used to silent worship, the cultivation of one's inner space is important to me, and poetry helps here. The exploration of inner space, the articulation of emotions, the development of intuition and self-knowledge can be difficult. Just as the universe needs dark matter, we need weight to ground us, to hold together our experiences as we explore. It occurred to me while writing this that the word space contains the word pace. Pace, spelt P-A-C-E, is the Latin word for peace. On the page, and for those who don't know Latin, the word pace can also read as pace. Pace equals peace. This has become one of my interior mantras. My sense is that when we are able to abide in that space, we allow ourselves to travel some small distance towards living in time. Kairos time, not clock and calendar watching Kronos time. And with that comes a greater sense of ease and well-being. When we can simply be, present with what is, our sense of receptivity and availability increases, and with that our clarity of purpose, efficacy and experience of interconnectedness. 
One of the notes that was sounded for our work together this year is expressed on the 2025 initiative website. We as humanity are the enablers of the plan. Our task is to manifest in our personal lives and in our own immediate environment, the changes we wish to see in the world. Our life energy is our most vital and powerful currency. We must endeavor to invest it with discernment and insight. The new economy is emerging as a result of the choices we make individually and as a group. And here, of course, economy refers not only to finances and money, but also to ecology and energy of a personal, etheric and telepathic nature. It applies too to our use or abuse of practical and natural resources. The statement on the website continues, living congruent lives is in itself a service. Our own radiance is the clearest evidence of a Christ at work in the world. So art, poetry, music and science, each is a discipline of research. Each penetrates the unknown and draws it down to heal the cleavages and to meet the need. In one sense, this speaks to us of a deeply personal story and on another, one that is deeply impersonal and transpersonal. Poet Denise Levitoff wrote, insofar as poetry has a social function, it is to awaken sleepers by other means than shock. I am going to finish with a poem that I wrote after a season in Antarctica. It's, called, it's titled Whirl, spelled as you can see, W-H-O-R-L. In it, a scientist wakes up to the fact that the porcelain cup from which he drinks his daily tea is made of clay that contains the fossil remnants of foraminifera and coccolithophores, ancient ancestors of the same microscopic creatures that he's been studying in his laboratory in New York for three decades. The poem hints at simultaneity and at the delights and disciplines of work, also the dissolution of time and space. Will, for Catherine and Sam. Her universe, a potter's wheel, sand and stars, a whirl, a whirl beneath her hands. Oceans away, the chalky cliffs of Dover, patient catalogue of protests, the ancient tracks and trailing filigree of ghostly coccolithophores. High priestess, she needs these fossil creatures into her white clay body, dares to put a new spin on things. Light years away, a scientist traces the curves of her high-fired porcelain, grows tearful. All this while and without knowing, he has partaken in an exuberant cosmic banquet, sharing tea with organisms ordinarily held captive beneath a lens in a dark and silent room. He gulps with new and holy curiosity. Miniature planets, small miracles aglow, tumble to ground from skies and oceans deep. No more the tedium or dust of routine scrutiny. He peers now through the poet's lens, all prior presumptions forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire and Helena. They were very uplifting. Uh, compliments to my talk. And uh, I think uh, we may want to keep a moment of silence before we go to the Q&A or go directly to it, uh, your call. I think a good idea is just to have a moment of silence to allow um, all this input to land. We're going to um, enter now a period of question and answers and invite all attendees to please um, share your thoughts, your inspirations, your ideas, 
And um, we're going to invite also Alex Ratcliffe, who is in uh, Twickenham in London, to join us. Um, I found a beautiful quote that Alex had actually spoken during the Aries full moon uh, recently, or last year, and she said, whatever we know or we don't know, our service to humanity remains the same. It is this, we need to heal harm. Whatever it is, if we know of harm, if we see or discover harm, and we are able to fix it, heal it, then this is what we are responsible to do. I'm sure uh, you will, um, Alex will be well known to, to, to all of you. She's been an amazing um, on the grounds commentator on the complex Brexit EU situation. So Alex, are you, yes. are you out there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Welcome. Thanks for joining can you hear me us. Right? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Jose, would you like to facilitate the q and A? I'll hand over yes. to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we can do it as a panel, but uh, that's fine. I'll be here. Mm -hmm. Good. I want to thank you, Jose, Helena, and Claire. It's just been beautiful moving us from science through religion to wonder and a sense of timelessness. That's quite magical to have right there been able to do that in that time. So I, my role here is just to open the floor to question, questions and answers and to be facilitated by, by whomever. I've made a number of notes uh, myself and I, I had a few questions, but I'm so um, in a state of timelessness after <laughs> Claire's presentation, particularly about all of us being in the past, the present and the future at once and the stars and so forth. Something that just fills you with so much awe, there isn't, there isn't much you, you can say about it. But um, I, I wanted to say that I've, I've noted that in my own chart, um, I have in Aquarius, my sun, my Venus, uh, Venus, uh, Jupiter, and Vesta. I'm not. I'm not sure because I'm not brilliant in astrology what all of that means, but I know that I thrill at the energy of Aquarius, and I. I. I was also thinking we're talking about the future, and I was thinking in the future when people go for a job interview or a college application, instead of saying what they do they can say their rheology and their astrology because we're talking about being suited to this work, aren't we? So, uh, and, and these particular seed groups. So I think because time is probably limited, the question I wanted to focus on was when um, Jose said about the fact of the soul as a creative factor, why has there been a delay? And we can discuss that. If anyone wishes to, I'd love to hear what they have to say, why they think there's been a delay, but also what advances there has been in that area, because it, it's not been absent since 1975. It's been growing, hasn't it? And I just wanted to mention uh, the the work of the British author and scientist Rupert Sheldrake. If, if, if anyone doesn't know him, then please, uh, his most recent book, Science and Spiritual Practices, is a wonderful one to give friends and family who aren't necessarily esotericists. And when he discusses actual practices relating to nature, singing, chanting, ritual, and and relating to plants and also recognizing the superhuman kingdoms and that the sun is conscious. And he puts it in such uh, simple language that anyone can understand it. And of course, his most famous book is The Science Delusion. But, And I thought that was an example of, of someone and some ones and groups who are doing this work to discover through science that the soul exists. So I think that I'll just leave that there and uh, open the floor to uh, any other comments anyone wants to make. And thank you again.
for such inspiration. Alex, you read my mind. That's exactly the direction I wanted to go. So please, uh, others, <laughs> and, and thank you for clarifying the difference uh, between the soul uh, as the evidence of survival after death, the individual uh, soul, and the, the soul as uh, Sheldrake, for instance, presents that, uh, which is basically using the etheric uh, plane, the etheric body, as the, the way to ensoul matter. That's another way. And we know that the etheric body uh, is uh, a good symbol presenting uh, the, the soul in its own plane. So thank you for making the clarification. Uh, so the question is, are we delayed because it didn't happen by 1975? Or are we just misinterpreting uh, the discoveries uh, and the progress uh, done so far? And uh, in fact, we are making progress in that direction. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Others. Let's hear from others. Uh, there is a raised hand, so I will unmute Rebecca. Um, hi, I um, did a student report on um, this uh, seed group, and I found that. Um, the IBM scientist Marcel Vogel was a beautiful example of um, one of the scientific observers. Um, also, uh, I'll read out a quote. Um, this is uh, a mix of um, my words and, and then I'll add quotations from Marcel Vogel. So he was a scientist, he was a scientist of the Aquarian age using faceted crystal technology. He was an IBM scientist, so very fifth ray. And in his journal, he writes, I am a scientist. I have devoted my life to this study of phenomena, the aspects of nature that are amenable to study through the analytical instruments that science has to offer. He demonstrated and lived the Aquarian qualities of telepathy, not the old Atlantean and sixth ray psychism. He complemented this deep spirituality, service and sacrifice um, and says, all I ever asked is for the instrument or tools to discover the methodology of measurement so that I could get the data to present to the outside world. My inner self knew, and uh, this is a commentary. By this point in Vogel's development, it had become clear that his work was now more spiritual science than conventional engineering or basic science, but strongly rooted in concrete knowledge and analytical science. He says, I knew I had to have a measuring instrument if I was going to proceed. I put out in my prayers, and then a month later, I received an Omega One psychotronic instrument from Daniel Perkins in Nevada. And that came right out of the blue sky in 1974. So I had the Omega One at the time I was introducing a group of doctors to my highly faceted healing crystals. So um, uh, this, this all started to emerge in 1975. I'll just um, add a little more evidence, but Jose, since we're talking about that time frame, So Vogel began to cut crystals to use as therapeutic tools in 1974 and 75 as a result of an amazing visionary dream that revealed information about sacred geometry and the ideal forms for quartz crystals. Vogel said in his journals, I had started cutting the crystals myself in my garage in 1974-75. In late 1974, I awoke one morning and saw a pattern in my mind's eye, which I later identified to be the tree of life, as shown in the Kabbalah. It was in this period during 74-75 that Vogel realised that when you pulse a coherent thought, like repeating a mantra, and simultaneously pulse your breath 
out through your nose in a series of bursts, you can impart your intent, your loving energy, and a huge stream of universal life force energy into the energy field of a quartz crystal, where it is used and held for use in meditation or healing sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that uh, contribution. And uh, yes, I'm very interested in uh, in crystals from that perspective, the, the healing perspective of it, and how uh, the intention of the healer can be somehow uh, imprinted uh, into a crystal. But I'm also interested in the other possibilities, how these crystals can be used, as we know, as radio stations. Uh, crystals are used uh, as receivers, as part of the technology uh, to build the radio. And again, I'm, maybe I'm obsessed, uh, but uh, uh, finding some way that we can have, uh, as part of the psychical research movement, some uh, evidence of survival after death that is not just hearsay or just uh, some uh, scenes and mediums uh, uh, holding their hands, but some, some objective radio, TV evidence uh, that we, we really do not die. There's something surviving uh, in the death experience uh, that uh, we still are short of uh, approving. Uh, you understand the, the, the implication, the major implication of that happening uh, from the legal aspect and, uh, and other uh, aspects of the, of the situation. Uh, but I think that would be a, a, a smashing blow to the glamour of mat materialism, uh, materiality, materialism. Uh, and that's the reason that I also that, see that aspect of working with uh, with crystals sensitive enough to be able to record uh, uh, energy uh, that are uh, not even uh, that is more subtle than the what the the brain uh, is able to transmit. But thank you very mm -hmm. much for that uh, very uh, illuminating comment. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. There's one more raised hand. I will unmute Don. Can you hear me? Hi, Dan. Hi, hi. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, um, talk about a book and a person. Um, Jude Curriven, Dr. Jude Curriven, who's wrote, written a book recently called uh, The Cosmic Hologram. Mm -hmm. um, Jude is, uh, has got numerous science degrees but she's also a very spiritual person in that she's been able to kind of see beings from other dimensions since she was a little girl. Um, but she's written this book which draws together uh, new cutting edge science from across all the different disciplines, which is basically saying that underneath um, the, the, the physics and the energy uh, understanding of the time are information fields. And these information fields are there throughout the whole of the universe, interconnecting and holding everything in being, a bit like God as the ground of being, if you like. Um, and this this pattern is replicated uh, like a holographic image throughout the whole of the universe, as above, so below. Everything is replicated in the same kind of fractal patterns throughout the whole of of creation. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. I, I, I did a, a a thing with her on oneness, uh, a conference on oneness called We Are All One. And basically, she was saying from her scientific perspective that we are all one, we are all interconnected, and we are all part of this whole cosmic hologram. Uh, and I was saying from the perspective of looking at the writings of the mystics, that the mystics have actually been saying this for thousands of years. Um, uh, and we, we, we came together, really. And I think this is science and religion coming together, which is part of the, part of the uh, esoteric teaching, um, that uh, science and religion will be, and there will be a new religion which will be partly based on science, and it seems to be happening. So uh, I'd just like to recommend that, if you're of a science mind, uh, that book, The Cosmic Hologram, Jude Curriven. Thank you, Dan. And I think of, of all the uh, findings uh, that we can bridge from science, uh, the metaphor of the hologram, the holographic universe, is one of the uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. this one that I can see mine, I think, uh, uh, Sheldrick's uh, work. My own conversion uh, four decades ago uh, from a, a phase of agnosticism as a scientist and coming into uh, the world of uh, esotericism came with the reading of uh, uh, the Tower of Physics by, by Capra uh, yeah. many, many years ago. So uh, this blend of, the, of, of Western uh, science uh, discoveries and uh, Eastern mysticism, I think there's a, a lot of room there for, uh, for building bridges and works such as the one that you quote is a, a step in that direction. Thank you for sharing. Jose, may I, um, this is Helena, may I <laughs> kind of come in on that one? Yeah, um, yeah. so uh, this is what I didn't get to mention regarding Master Hawarian who is a um, um, the fifth ray master working with religion and it's said in the teachings that he mm -hmm. is um, taking some of the students of the master jesus um into his his ashram and what's interesting about um him is that he is the reincarnation of um saint paul and so you know when you're thinking about what um when i was thinking about your your other slide there um the influence of master hawarian uh bringing these um these energies of religion and science together uh you know and at the um the turn of um the century actually in it was it was said in 1893 there was a scientist that said well it's probably you know true that all the greatest discoveries in the field of physics have already been made and there's nothing new and um it's just going to be a summarization of the old and then you know then just years later two years later 1895 um wilhelm Rentgen um discovered the x-ray and then after that at the turn of the century was um all of these explosions through the the um the science of relativity einstein's relativity which by the way he discovered through a meditation and riding a beam of light and it came to his awareness that way and then all the the um the holographic um, as you're mentioning, all the holographic sciences came about, and there's so much beautiful scientific teachings. I was immersed in it also about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, in holography and, and the application of that to, to unfolding human potential. So, as you mentioned the idea earlier, that the blow of materialism against materialism, that kind of concrete mind uh, opening to the, to the truly scientific inquiring mind into wonder, beauty uh, came about really early early last century and it's just been growing ever since great thank you oh you know what i wanted to say there um even alexander directly to to responding to your question um that alex so beautifully put forth i I think that the soul, the, the fact of the soul is coming out in a number of different ways. Um, you know, in addition to the scientific instruments that we're still waiting for that can really measure these things. Um, you know, if you look at the, the book lists that have come out in the last 20 years, the number of books written about the soul. So this, this has really broken free in, in the consciousness of humanity. And, and I don't think people necessarily need to have science prove to them that the soul exists. They, they're experiencing it on their own and particularly in the arena of um, the life after death of people who have had death experiences. And one of the most profound ones that I've come across is many, but through Eben Alexander, a neuroscient, neurosurgeon who uh, had meningitis and his brain swelled to the degree that he should have been dead. And he met on the other side these beings of light and, and sun and um, it proved to him, and he was a materialist and it proved to him that um, that the soul exists. So I think maybe um, that idea needs to be uh, adapted a little bit that it's just going to come through the scientific instruments. I, yeah. I, I agree and, and thank you very much for bringing the, uh, that up. Uh, that's, uh, that's a quite an, uh, an important point. Yes, I was, uh, Alex here, yes, I was just going to say, Helena, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? it? It's definitely 
all over the place and making, you know, that knowledge is making its way. But it, it needs to really come into the mainstream because I know scientists and I have scientists in my family and they work with scientists and it hasn't it hasn't hit the ground yet, has it? But when you have great names like, well, for example, here, Sheldrake, you know, making these inroads, um, it's the beginning. It's the beginning, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But, but, but as you, wonderful, you know, as you pointed out, science without religion, religion without science, it makes sense. It, it should make sense to everyone, shouldn't it? <laughs> We're not, we're not completely there yet. Yeah, and and I think that you know it's it's really a matter of consciousness that the materialistic scientists have not broken yet into the experience of the soul, and those who have are practicing an entire different science. And it's the same if you reverse it. There are people in religion who are extremely um, materialistically focused, and they're not truly spiritual at all they're 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 locked into doctrines and theology so i think it's really dependent upon where one's consciousness is hello this is martha uh can i am i heard yes we hear Hi, martha. you this was a brilliant presentation so much beauty and and wholeness in it and thank you for the question Alex, it, it crossed my mind that as we, as you've demonstrated, the convergence of the two is essential to our understanding. It also occurred to me, and having read uh, Jude Caravan's Cosmic Hologram, that, that one of the glamours that may interfere with, with the uh, presence of the soul is we uh, humans we look at it from an individual perspective, and that that in order for the recognition of soul presence, which is really among us, the the glamour that we need to get rid of is it is more obvious when we look at the at at all life from a cosmic hologram perspective. Uh, uh, the the challenges that we have is if we look through the lens of politics or through the lens of individuality, the limitation of soul presence uh, makes it quite difficult sometimes to recognize it. So my, my wonder, my question is, what if it's all occurred as said, and now it's up, particular, it's up to the, and especially the new group of world servers, to celebrate it, to celebrate the fact that we can see so, we live in so, we experience so, when we experience the oneness of ourselves with all things. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. So, so much has to do with the way that we language things too, isn't it? Doesn't it? Um, language can be you know a portal and it can be a barrier <laughs> and i just recently had this very touching experience where the scientist i was working with down in antarctica who was a, a real skeptic about all things um es esoteric and kind of soul related um and he went to an exhibition of hilma af klimt's work in the guggenheim if you're anywhere near new york i would i absolutely urge you to go to it because she was well, an esoteric or it was an esotericist she died uh, over 20 years ago, and in her um, notebooks, actually asked that her paintings not be shown until 20 years after her death, because she knew that the world wasn't ready to meet them. Um, and you know, so, so much of our ageless wisdom teachings is threaded through those paintings. And there was a photograph of of, of my friend Sam, you know, in the context of, of that exhibition. And 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 I just I just know that it would have moved him, you know. <laughs> Um, and something will shift, and you know the change happens in so many, um, either small and subtle or dramatic ways. We don't know, uh, mm -hmm. but we can trust it's happening. <laughs> uh, dear friends, we are this time it's, it went way over the time that we normally allocate for the webinars and. Uh, 
I think we should still use the opportunity of this gathering during the full moon time for us to meditate together. So maybe it's a good time for us to proceed with the meditation, even though there's a number of comments that uh, I reposted in the um, conversation section, so you can please read them. But probably it's time for us to move to meditation. Yes, thank you for being our timekeeper, Sasha. Yes, and thank Helena you, Sasha. Going to, yeah, Helena is going to lead us in meditation. Uh, and how much time shall I take for this? Sasha, what do you think? Um, I don't have an answer that, to that question. <laughs> it's difficult. Okay. okay. I think we'll just trust you to um, oh, take right. the time oh. to take the time it takes. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Yeah, good. All right, friends. Let us bring our awareness to the breath, the breath that is the life pouring through the universe. And be present with the breath that is breathing you, breathing us. And if you will, bring your awareness to the top of the crown where the life energies flow through into the receptive instrument. And as we continue to breathe, let us extend our awareness of the life energy <laughs> to all of us here gathered in the unified, coherent field of love. and the love that informs all life. And the love that informs the heart. And the love that informs the mind. And the love that informs the physical etheric. And the beautiful and potent seed thought for Aquarius waters of life am I, poured forth for thirsty humanity. So let us imagine these waters flowing through all sentient life. Cleansing and healing all that is not of its vibration. and lifting and raising all the subtle bodies, the physical etheric, the sentient body, the mind, 
fear of livingness. And in this pregnant, unified field, let us affirm that throughout the universe, it is the soul, which is the conscious, sensitive theme of the divine plan. Universe, it is the soul, which is the conscious, sensitive theme of the divine plan. As a group, let us link soul to soul. With all here present. And as a group, let us link with the great potency of the inner groups the ashrams of the masters of the Lord of Love, who in turn is linked with that center where the will of God is known, who in the great chain of being is linked with the soul of the universe, the son of divine love. Who in this time period as the great wheel turns to Aquarius and the cleansing healing rays pouring through the universe through all the planets and the planet Earth back through all the centers the sacred centers of the planet Let us stand in unified, coherent will of love that the soul of humanity come forth
So together and as one. Let us sound the great invocation. Streaming forth these energies to and through the soul of humanity, to all sanctified groups, to all soul initiatives and projects in fulfillment of the plan of God. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. So be it. Thank you very much, Helena. Thank you, everyone, for um, being so fully present and with us in the past, the present, and the future today. <laughs> um, thank you for your contributions and Jose for being um, so generous in your offering and your teaching. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> so, um, Sasha, is there anything else um, that we need to um, say about upcoming webinars? Um, I think you have those details. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this very powerful focus and the meditation. And let's continue our work together and uh, Please join our coming webinars. On February 6th, we will uh, continue our work following the cycle of the New Moon uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals meditations. This time we will focus on the Goal 17, Partnership for the Goals, and our Focalizing Triangle. This time we'll, we'll have representatives of Russia, United States, United Kingdom coming together to share on the topic of partnership. 
And on February 17th, um, the next solar festival, Pisces Solar Festival, we will bring our focus to the uh, last of the seed groups in our journey across the zodiac, the seed group of telepathic communicators. And our guest will be Kathy Newburn. Thank you so much. And uh, let's keep our alignment uh, these days as we prepare to the high moment of this full moon with the, the coming powerful eclipse. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Blessings as we go.